sustainability really has an environmental orientation to it more so than a holistic business orientation. What I believe is trending is that broader definition where sustainability is this kind of all-encompassing perspective on the future being equally as good as the present. Welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast from the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management at the Naveen Jindal School of Management. Here at the University of Texas at Dallas, we bring together business leaders and other forward thinkers to discuss how best to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing, increasingly complex healthcare ecosystem. I'm Dr. Bob Kaiser, Director of the Master's Program in Healthcare Leadership and Management. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting app to ensure you don't miss any of the future episodes. You can also join us online at businessofhealthcarepodcast.com. Today's Business of Healthcare podcast topic deals with the future sustainability of healthcare. That's right, sustainability. There's no better business lens to evaluate the complexity of today's healthcare system than to see it through the eyes of mergers and acquisitions. We welcome John Henderson from the law firm Pulsinelli which is widely recognized as one of the nation's preeminent firms for healthcare law. John serves as the Business Services Division Chair, Corporate and Transactional Chair, and most recently became Pulsinelli's first Chair of R&D and Innovation. So welcome to the Business of Healthcare, John. Thank you, Bob. Glad to be here. Well, John, I'm glad to be introduced to you by Dr. Jim Walton, one of our faculty here at the University of Texas, Dallas. I've enjoyed learning more about your research and law practice, and you're truly passionate and dedicated in your efforts to create patient-centered, sustainable health care. I understand that for over 20 years, you've been involved in leveraged buyouts, growth capital, merger and acquisition, divestiture, joint venture transactions, a whole broad range of healthcare things. And your involvement is really the background for what we want to talk about. You've been intimately involved um, in your firm. And most recently, I know that you've published, I've read some of your publications, but um, you've put together a white paper that's entitled Healthcare Prime, Patient-Centered Sustainable Healthcare. I understand that came from really two practice areas at the firm, mergers and acquisition, along with the healthcare regulatory. So tell us here, tell us more about this white paper and how it fits into our topic of the day. Yeah, Bob, thank you. Uh, And so, again, really, really glad to be here. And uh, I guess I should have the disclaimer as a lawyer that everything I say is my own personal opinions and not those of the firm or clients. Uh, But uh, as uh, as I get started with that, this this whole, uh, you know, journey really began 16 years ago when uh, when we started the Healthcare Dealmakers Conference, the BFW uh, Health Industry Council. Yes, and was a part of that, and we partnered with with uh, to do the Healthcare Dealmakers Conference, and um, and that was this conference that had the premise that M and A and innovation are the drivers in growth in healthcare services, and uh, and we did that together for for several years, uh, and then uh, and then a handful of years ago we started a white paper series that had the same the premise that M and A and innovation are the drivers in growth in healthcare services, and and that first paper was Healthcare Prime. And it really, it really identified that uh, it took the J.P. Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon announced business uh, creation, and and noted that that's something different. Uh, and as we looked at that, uh, really used it to to identify six themes that were driving healthcare at that time and have continued to today. Uh, and wrote about those and used examples of how we how we uh, you know how we thought about it. Uh, and then that healthcare prime series continued, and we've done uh, this last paper you mentioned is the the fifth paper in that series, um, and each one had some spark that you know uh, gave us the idea that it was something worth writing about. So this patient centered sustainable healthcare piece really evolved out of uh, I did. Uh, in my leadership and management roles within the law firm did uh, Stegen leadership academies, integral leadership program. Uh, And that, that has, you know, conscious capitalism as one of its affiliated ideas. Uh, And then my daughter uh, went to college and became a sustainability major. 
And so I think it's those two things that, that caused me to like connect the dots. And, uh, and then with always these papers have a, a really great team of internal, uh, you know, colleagues that work on them with me. Um, uh, and it was beginning to look at that and think about it and say, you know, what is sustainability exactly and how in the world does that apply to healthcare? Well, you know, when you, when you mentioned the healthcare prime and you, you talk about these six different categories, I'm going to mention those because a lot of those topics and what you call healthcare prime are things that we actually have in our curriculum here at the University of Texas Dallas in our executive ed program, our Alliance for Physician Leadership program and our healthcare leadership program. But topics like consumerism, uh, continuity of care, uh, the data revolution, outpatient care, value based care, private equity ownership, all those things are, are fundamental concerns and issues that we deal with today. Um, you know, I, I saw some recent publications that talk about uh, private equity in healthcare and and how it's how it's really changing things up. Like a great number of, of the physicians today, like seventy percent, are owned by by corporations um, and private equity firms, etc. So we could we could spend quite a bit of time just talking about those six categories of of the prime that you mentioned. Can we have a few words on your on your perspective on the private equity ownership and where that's trending right now before we get deeper into the sustainability? Yeah, absolutely. So I've uh, you know I've done this work for thirty thirty two years now, and uh, and so through that I've experienced the you know the you know, way way back uh, the beginnings of when private equity began to invest in in different types of healthcare services and have been a part of that you know for my entire career. And I guess, you know, if I'm if I'm evaluating, you know, I, I think that's a good thing. So I'm I'm one of the people that lines up with believing that there's, you know, positives that come from capital and professionalism of licensed businesses, uh, really across them all, right? So engineering, architecture, medicine, law, you know, all of those has various stages of of you know capital that's provided either by the licensed professionals or by outsiders, either as debt or equity. And so as I live, you know, live through all those, I'm, I'm a proponent of the role of, you know, professional capital, financial sponsors in business. As we move forward, um, thinking more about the sustainability topic, what are the different elements when you think of sustainability? Can we come up with a definition of what that means? Because it could be confusing depending on how it's used and in what industry. You know, I'll start by saying I'm a learner on this topic. And so what I know I've I've learned the last, you know, eight to nine months. And we so I, <laughs> we <and> all so are. <laughs> as I've sought to, as I've sought to understand that, you know, what, one of the things we tried to do by capturing these five dimensions that we think define patient centered or, or what I've now referred to as stakeholder centered sustainable healthcare, uh, each of them has, you know, some component to it or this idea of sustainability and the core definition of sustainability that's, you know, used in the world is that you know this generation does things in a way that that make uh, opportunities and resources equally available to the next generation, and so it's the opposite of you know wasting. It's the opposite of you know leaving a scorched earth when you're done, and it it really first you know arose in the environmental context, um, and so sustainability in the you know when you get into how it's discussed within the context of of ESG, environmental, social, and governance that, that I know will be part of our conversation, sustainability really has an environmental orientation to it more so than a holistic business orientation. What I believe is trending is that broader definition where sustainability is this kind of all-encompassing perspective on the future being equally as good as the present. Well, you know, we talk about sustainability and we talk about in today's world, uh, there are so many risk factors. Hopefully there's a risk element involved in, in every every conversation that we have. It wasn't long ago that Kaufman Hall, they came out there, they're they, they do research in, in the healthcare area and they came out with a financial impact and mentioned that Texas hospitals are at risk of closure is, has doubled since the year 2020. And even the rural hospitals are even at a higher risk and you stop and think about sustainability just in any one segment of our industry. Um, what are the things that that basically can threaten that? I know that the cost of capital now has changed. It used to be very low. Now it's it's higher with low margins. Does that figure into the sustainability equation? It, it does. And the way what's 
the way I've come to, you know, part of this, this learning process I've been going through as I'm reading and, and, you know, thinking about this topic is that what has really hit home to me uh, most recently is that when you think about the historical uh, ESG arose as this investment uh, risk mitigation tool to evaluate the quality of companies from that, that perspective, what's really going on is that companies that can be led and operated and organized and, you know, do what they do as their business activity and pay attention to the multifaceted aspects of, of ESG and capital and workforce, all of these things that are the complexity in the business of healthcare, the company that can do those things is actually a better company. It's, it's really recognizing it as, uh, you know, as a way to reframe how you're thinking about how well a company is managed, led, capitalized, you know, what it what it is in business to do. And the more holistic and the more uh, the more comprehensive it is in this complex environment of the business of healthcare, the better a company it is, the safer a company it is, the better it is at having mitigated its risks. Okay. So we use that term ESG, uh, environmental, social and governance. That emerged quite a few years ago. Like you said, primarily it had an initial focus on maybe some environmental things, but it really relates to investments, you know, environmental, social, and governance uh, related to investments. Examples today, let's see, CBS, they just bought, uh, who'd they buy recently? Oak Street? They're in, in talks to, that is a proposed combination. It's not yeah, close it's yet. In the, it's in the news. It's in the news. Mm -hmm. An example of Oak Street, though, being an ESG company. Can you unpill that a little bit? You know, as, as we did the white paper, wrote about a handful of examples, and then I recently did a, a talk at the ABA Emerging Health Law Issues on a, a panel that uh, that had two, you know, ESG experts and, and me, who is, I'm not an ESG, you know, <laughs> ESG expert at all, but I, I wanted a way to, you know, communicate about the sustainability topic. And so, you know, rethought, you know, what's an example out in the world? And was curious because of the things I had read about Oak Street Health, you know, just how they how they viewed that or how they showed up. And it turns out that in January they issued their first ESG report. And when you work your way through it, it is doing, you know, from from formation what we've described as this sustainable healthcare idea. And so, and what that means is, and really the strategy behind that is that you build your business model and your choices about capital and workforce and location and accessibility and just all those aspects of providing and delivering healthcare, build them around that idea you know, that are the themes and the ideas, if not rigid ESG compliance, they're thematically consistent with that. And so what's fascinating is that we, you know, we read their report, analyzed it against our five dimensions that define sustainable healthcare. And you end up with this really neat checklist that gives you, you know, really illustrates what it looks like to create that type of business. What the marketplace would tell us is that that's a very high value business. So when we stop and look at the different perspective of sustainability, I've seen things that say, look at it from the perspective of the relationship to the individual, the relationship to the environment and the relationship to inequality. Are, are those three of the key perspectives that would go along with your research? It, they are, and then if you you know if you if you reframe that or think about it, what you're really doing is taking a, a, a stakeholder orientation, and so each each of those you know has a stakeholder orientation. Uh, you'd add the community to it, you'd add providers to it, and so you can you can expand who those stakeholders are, you know, depending on what the context is. But what you're what you're doing when you've accomplished a sustainable business is take all of those into account and be respectful of or mindful of or cognizant of the fact that each of them needs to win uh, with what they're about doing. So when we talk about patient-centered care, um, you know, sometimes we feel like we've lost the sense of community among the clinicians, you know, the doctors, the nurses, the advanced practitioners, the administrators, and trying to really reestablish this sense of community has this focus on patient-centric care I can see where that kind of fits into the concept here of sustainability. You mentioned these five different categories. Let's go down those, if, you, if we don't mind, for the benefit of our listeners. And, and the first one, triple aim. 
Um, that's not anything new, but but kind of give us the why is that a key element in sustainability? And so the triple, uh, you know, when you when you trace this back and forward, you know, the triple aim of healthcare that's twenty years old now, you know, quality, access, and cost. Yep. And that very much, you know, those those three concepts very much drive you know many investment pieces today, and much of what you know healthcare businesses talk about being about. Yet, you know, who who has actually gotten there? And so you look at triple aim in and of itself, and it, it lacks it lacks sort of you know a full implementation capability. And if that's if we've got if that's the status quo and we've gotten there, you know, most people would say we're not done yet. And so it's you know it's a concept, and then along comes quadruple aim, which takes into account you know arguably this fourth missing piece of the puzzle, another stakeholder of the clinical workforce. And you know that that's what caused me to uh, you know shift from patient centered to stakeholder centered. Okay. Uh, because I yeah I really focused on hey this must all be about the patient, and of course it has to be that. But then I had this aha moment where you know I've actually overemphasized that, and it has to be you know about all stakeholders, which is the point that we were trying to make. Uh, but even in my own writing and thought processes, you know. Uh, skipped over the past that it needs to be more holistic like that. Yeah. You know, the care, the, the physicians, you know, it's physician burnout. That's another whole topic for the business of healthcare. We've had topics on that, how, how this affects, you know, that's the quadruple lane. They're looking at the quality of their existence as well. Um, that's problematic, you know, in terms of sustainability. If, if physician leaders are getting burnout, uh, if they're dealing with what they might call, Severe cases of moral injury, you know, um, they're, they're being forced to do things and, and get engaged with things that, that really challenge their values and beliefs. If we don't deal with those things, obviously you can't sustain the growth. How many, how many, uh, private physicians have been bought into, um, a larger corporation to find out that maybe that isn't the exact environment they thought they were getting into. So having a holistic view on that would, would make a, a lot of sense. So I think now they've got a, a beyond the quadruple gain, I think they got the um, quintuple or whatever the word might be gain. <laughs> so, right. Right. Well, I, I think, and that's what's, you know, what's interesting is that any, uh, you know, any licensed profession, including law that, you know, that, has this bespoke way of having existed for a hundred whatever years, you know, that has some paternalism to it and has some, you know, protectionism and how we conduct ourselves. There's always a tension point when you bring an unlicensed profession into the management of that business. Yep. But I just, you know, my fundamental belief is that doesn't have to be so. And so it's, it's the disalignment, it's the misunderstanding, it's the not having your eye on the same target, and that creates, you know, what appears to be opposition when I don't, I really don't think it has to exist, but that's that, you know, quality of management, quality of communication, that better run business yep. is where you see that. And, and those exist in the world. And that's what, that's what, you know, sort of enheartened me, you know, to believe that that's possible. Well, I think, I think universities, hospitals, large law firms, they all have in common a standardization they like things to be standardized. They like a process of efficiency. You know, it's a professional bureaucracy. Yeah, it's scale, right? This episode is brought to you by the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, the definitive resource for healthcare management education in North Texas. The center is based in the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. It plays a unique role in training the next generation of healthcare leaders to meet local, regional, and national demands. The Jindal School uses its strengths in accounting, administration, finance, marketing, and information systems to educate highly qualified personnel for healthcare administration and executive leadership positions. The center is home to seven healthcare leadership and management programs, including undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as executive programs for physicians and working professionals. For more information, visit us online at jindal.utdallas.edu forward slash healthcare. So moving, moving down the line here from triple A, uh, we talked about ESG and governance. Let's discuss sy systemic resiliency. That's the third item here that we've got on our list of um, sustainability. What all does that mean now? That is a concept that, that we all learned about during COVID. And so, you know, that, that was my first exposure to it. And so that idea of, you know, is, is 
a system resilient to the pressures that come upon it or does it fail? And so, you know, COVID is this great real life example that we live through where the absence of systemic resiliency in some parts of healthcare and other businesses appeared. Uh, and so it's, you know, what do you do to get ahead of that and, and actually, you know, be able to, to live through or, or be sustainable during that type of pressure? Okay. Conscious capitalism. I think you could write a book on this. Um, <laughs> does it exist today? So I think that, you know, that might, as I mentioned, you know, my exposure to it was through some leadership training that I did. And then, you know, that I'm, I'm reminded of stakeholder capitalism, which I've heard about for lots of years and, and just piece that together. But it really is that core notion of, of, you know, doing good and doing well, that very much is, you know, is foundational in much of, of not-for-profit healthcare. You know, it's, you know, part of our context here is for-profit healthcare, not-for-profit healthcare, founder sponsor, public company, private equity, you know, tax exempt, all of these different ownership models for the business of healthcare, all are a part of the discussion because they come at it from their own stakeholder perspective. But, you know, this idea of can you do good and do well, you know, lot, lots of folks believe in. And I think it becomes, you know, we have we have a great example in Dallas, Fort Worth of a particular healthcare company that, that you know, is built upon that that idea. So it's out there. Well, we've seen that through a number of other podcast conversations. There's a lot of organizations now that are really looking at value-based um, healthcare, moving away from fee-for-service, uh, incorporating a whole variety of things that really start to lean into the, the last of these uh, five items, the social determinants of health. And I've heard somebody recently um, re redefine social determinants of health and use the term non-medical determinants of health. So let's go deeper into the social determinants of health, because I think that's an area where I think we can see a lot of change traction take place, because there are a lot of places where there are barriers, there are, I'll call them unequal opportunities to access health and to treat in a fair way. So let's discuss that a little bit further, if you don't mind. Absolutely. So I think your statement is is true. You know, and that, that's what's so interesting about all, all of these sustainability topics that you talk about. They're really hard not to just intellectually agree that there's truth to them. And and so that's you know one of the one of the goals of the work I'm doing around this is just create awareness and understanding and you know reframing of how to think about it. And so if you if you go through it with that lens uh, and you get the social determinants of health you know, sick care versus wellness, uh, access to food, education, housing, all of those things that, you know, that argue that they're just fundamental to, you know, to health. And, you know, I think it's the truth that those are not equally distributed. And and so part of the idea behind, you know, this sustainable health care is that it needs to, needs to, you know, there needs to be an operating model, a system of health that facilitates that. So if a healthcare organization, if they're a service organization and they want to become a better company that's identified as really embodying some of these sustainable healthcare ideas, you know, what, what's the coaching? Uh, what should it do? What I think we have, um, you know, I, I hesitate to stay stumbled across, but it wasn't exactly where I thought we were going to end up when we started you know, thinking about this. But as we worked on it, it began, it began to just reveal itself as a playbook and it began to reveal itself as a strategy and what I think is a really interesting, you know, thought process around this is that like all, you know, like all regulation applicable to the business of healthcare, you know, an owner operator investor in that business can look at it as, as a burden or an opportunity. Uh, and, and for certain you have to comply or, you know, bad, bad things happen. And so it really is how you understand regulation and the work you put into how it applies to your business to operationalize it. And so in my world, whether that's you know, structuring a joint venture to be compliant with the small lending investment safe harbor and the anti-kickback statute, or whether it's Medicare enrollment or, you know, CPOM uh, compliance, you know, corporate practice of medicine, whatever that may be, you're, you're structuring these really complex businesses to be compliant in that, in that regulatory environment. And if you look at these uh, requirements or themes that are defining you know, ESG and these other concepts that we 
combine is sustainable healthcare. What you're really doing is making a strategic choice to build yourself to be compliant with those and to be, you know, aware of that those exist. And if you do that, then you end up, you know, with this business that that I, you know, that there's evidence of that that's just a better run company. And so I think that's the, you know, the idea is that it is actually a, you know, it's an opportunity and it's a choice. And it, at its core, I say it's a strategy. And I, as I have thought about that idea, there's, you know, there's probably someone that is very um, ESG oriented as a rigid regulatory concept. And they may be offended by the idea that, that I say it's a strategy. But I think actually what causes it to be adhered to as a regulatory framework is that your strategy is to is to honor it or be compliant with it. And that's how business, healthcare businesses function. But we have to be careful with how we use words. Uh, words have connotation. Uh, they got previous use. I've, I've always said if we're introduced to, to um, electricity via the electric chair, we'd be afraid to turn the lights on. <laughs> You know, that's, so that's a great. We, yeah. we really have to be careful with with that because we don't want to alienate people. We're trying to raise the level of attention for physician leaders, in particular, in our executive education program, the Alliance for Physician Leadership. We're getting ready to introduce a new course in that program that that deals with board governance. And I think there's some recent laws. You're the lawyer. You might be able to update me on this, that some of these boards are going to be required to have physicians on the board. Is that is that something you've, you've heard recently? Uh, so I have not heard that. You know, you have in Texas, we have our certified nonprofit health organization entity that, that has a physician you know, board governance requirement. So I haven't heard that in particular, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if that's not out there somewhere in the country. Yeah, I think it's I think it's working. I'll get back with you on that in more detail. But our our whole idea here is if we can get um, a lot of the rural and small community hospitals. This is for hospitals, actually. Okay. Some of the small rural community hospitals uh, they have people on the board which are are good community neighbors, etc. But um, they may not have any experience or knowledge in healthcare, and adding physicians to the board there with concepts and ideas that uh, identify and embody some of these sustainable healthcare ideas uh, would be a great move forward in a lot of different ways. I'm sure that you see this in your private equity engagements. These topics come up as something being very important. Um, I'm sure that these things um, are not alien any longer to the business discussion, that they've got to be a, a key element. Uh, going forward. Do you see the private equity activity increasing in healthcare over the next several years, your perception? Yes. You know, there's across, you know, federal and across various states, there is regulatory activity around either disclosure of, or, you know, some interplay with private equity ownership. And so what I, you know, I think, you know, as the government, uh, as regulators sort of catch up with what's actually occurring, you know, in the entrepreneurial business world, First, they will set up, you know, information gathering regimes. And so you're seeing that now, you know, across various parts of the country. Uh, there's federal legislation about, you know, private equity ownership. And I, you know, like my my expectation, you know, in that there's an interplay between the uh, number of public companies and the ease of, of becoming public. The difficulty of that has been, you know, a, a trigger with the growth in private equity. And so you have, you know, you have these sort of like two, you know, two colliding concepts and, and capital is going to, you know, f get, find a place to be used. And so, you know, as that plays itself through the system, you know, you just, you expect that, you know, the right, the right result will happen and efficient capital will find efficient places to, to be deployed and continue to uh, consolidate, professionalize and scale, you know, different healthcare services. Okay, well, John, I'm going to refer our audience in the footnotes of this podcast to the Healthcare Prime Patient Centered Sustainable Healthcare White Paper that you um, were responsible and working on. Um, I think that's going to be. I've, I've read the entire paper several times now. It's it's several pages of of good information, uh, relevant information that really makes you stop and think and think about the different dimensions of being more stakeholder-centered or patient-centered and sustainable. Um, final word from you, what advice would you give our listening audience if they wanted to engage more or learn more? 
Yeah, I think it's too. Uh, it is to be, uh, you know, be a open learner of the topic, and uh, and I think that there is a definite. I, two weeks ago, I had a conversation with someone who was a, a very, uh, you know, very high, uh, you know, high level healthcare leader who who just, you know, when I began to explain the white paper and uh, you know use certain words, there was this kind of this negative reaction. And then we talked more and, and this person read the white paper and, and got it, you know. And so I think it's just let, let there sort of be a learning exercise that you go through and begin to see this more holistic view of sustainability. Excellent. Very good. Well, John, thank you for being part of the, uh, the podcast today. We're going to follow up with you more in the future because this is a growing topic. So uh, stay tuned to us. We'll be tuned into you as well. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Business of Healthcare podcast. To learn more about the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, go to jindal.utdallas.edu slash healthcare.